Welcome to the Aiki Dojo podcast. I am David Ito, Chief Instructor of the Aikido Center of Los Angeles, and with me is Mike Van Ruth, Aikido Fourth Don, Yaido Fourth Don, and Bill D'Angelo, Aikido Fourth Don. And today we have our first podcast listener question, and it comes from Jackie, one of our Aikido Center students. And here's her question. She says, "Good afternoon, Sensei." Um, for your next podcast, could you please uh, answer or discuss this question? Uh, can you talk about body, mind, and spirit in Aikido, specifically how, how back in the day did uh, the samurai uh, prepare and stay focused for war and chaos? Hmm. So I think she's asking about... It's hard to say a lot of those things that it's hard to... Because there's like a romanticism when we think about warriors of old, not just samurai, Spartans, you know, um, what would you, what would you call um, uh, ancient cultures? What, I don't know what's the word. For Classical it. culture. Classical cultures, like the samurai, Spartans. Classical warrior culture. Yeah, classical warrior culture. It's to to romanticize them. And think that oh, these people live this, these lives that were so much better than ours. Mythical, With, mythical. Yeah. But actually, the lives that they lived were actually pretty horrible. <laughs> yeah. You know what we know about the samurai today, the seven samurai virtues. Those were created by uh, Inazo Nitobe in it for his book Bushido, the Code of the Samurai, or something like that. When, in fact, uh, samurais, what we think is all these people that fought were all samurai. When, in fact, they weren't. Right. You know, they had, you had footmen, you had support people, vassals. And so these upper echelon people, th they were really the samurai. But the rest of the people were fighting were just fighters. Right? And so, you know, you're going to romanticize them that they all live these lives of the based on the warrior code and when it when in fact they probably only did the things which were culturally specific for them and the things that serve them what i when i think about this question what i, I think maybe mike might have a lot to say in this podcast being um uh having been an active duty soldier in combat is i wonder whether jackie's asking what can i do um, as an Aikido student, using the techniques of Aikido to prepare myself for conflict and to stay calm in conflict, whether it's actually in a physical confrontation during class where there's simulated combat uh, or just dealing with high stress situations. And when I think about that, I think that, you know, whether it's present day military culture or in the dojo, um, what, what comes to my mind is. Uh, you know, you're talking about classical military culture. I mean, the Romans and, and the Greeks cer certainly had the idea that um, you don't want to let uh, emotion, which affects you, to determine how you make decisions. And that the Greeks and the Romans had a very, a very well-developed theories of how to control your mind and your body. That you always tried to maintain yourself in a state of where you were self-determined. And then you would train yourself through specific mental and physical exercises so that you would stay self-control under stressed conditions. And I think the samurai also had similar techniques, and we have those techniques in Aikido too. But the question is, at what level were those people learning that? Not everyone learned those. No, no. But, I mean, well, you mentioned Spartans. I mean, the, certainly... The Spartans, which was a very small elite culture, there were probably only 30,000 male Spartan citizens at any one time. The men learned that from childhood. They were put through a process where they were, you know, like, for example, one of the things that they had to do was, at, I think at, starting at eight or nine years old, they were taken from their parents and they lived communally as boys and they were trained as soldiers from nine years old on. And one of the things that they had to do was from nine to four, 14, um, they were not like um, served, I think, dinner. They had to go out and steal or hunt their food. So they were taught um, like food stress. And so the feeling of being hungry, they had to learn to handle that stress uh, on their own. 
uh, or there's there's a mythical thing that the Spartans went through um, that this this was again to, to train uh, dealing with the stress of pain they would put an animal in their cloak that would like hurt them and they had to stay there and, and, and experience the pain and be stoic. What where's where the word stoic comes from? Not from the Spartans, but the Romans later developed this, where you would experience the pain, but you wouldn't show it because as a soldier, you have to be able to maintain um, composure while you're under pain. And the Spartans did all kinds of crazy ass stuff to to train the children from nine. And and in fact, the whole Spartan culture, the the men lived communally, not with the women. And then when they wanted to go with the women to have children, they would then leave the communal area to go off and spend time with the women, they would always come back. So, you know, I think that one way to look at this is that um, there are warrior cultures that develop very specific techniques to develop that. But what interests me with respect to Jackie's question is, what what do we do now that's been derived from those other cultures that help us? And I think the key thing that the, the Greeks and Romans did was that they put themselves in repetitive stress situations over and over and over again so that um, they understood what the stress was so that they could remain calm during the stress and make competent decisions. So, Well, from a, now that you mentioned that uh, through uh, military experiences, the training is meant to, short of actual combat, is to create what they call stress inoculation. Right. If if you're never put under a stressful situation, all of a sudden it happens, you're going to react to that stress differently. Right. Tunnel vision, uh, aud- auditory exclusion, all these weird things that happen when you're under a stressful situation. But to put them through a process of where they're stressing you out, stressing you out, not a constant state of stress. That's where we get into things like PTSD and things of that sort. But to stress inoculate that individual so when a stressful situation does come, it's not so physically... Uh, difficult on that person are able to still push forward and not be uh, susceptible not to the frozen. physical aspects of stress. Well, I mean, what other things do the Greeks, Romans, Spartans do to stress inoculate? Uh, they would they would do they had this one particular exercise that Seneca, who's one of the most famous Roman Stoics, they would. Uh, they were specifically worried about uh, how anger affected <coughs> bad decision making. And so what they would do is they would imagine all the physiological experiences that you would go through with anger, your face getting red, your pulse getting faster, and then they would um, simulate the experience of anger and then see how the physical aspects of anger um, were unpleasant and then as soon as you would go through that, then they would stop. And uh, so there would be this self-exploration of the f- why you don't want to experience the negativity of anger. And, and basically you would train yourself over time to resist uh, and, and essentially teach yourself that you don't have to live in anger. And one of the techniques that they used, Marcus Aurelius, who was the probably the most famous Stoic because he was the emperor of of Rome, is he kept a daily journal. And what he would do is every time he felt something that was disturbing his equilibrium, he would write it down in his journal. And by constantly keeping a record of all the things that disturbed his equilibrium, he would then learn how to constantly self-correct on a daily basis. And that's how we get um, his his, uh, meditations, meditations, which is probably one of the most famous... Um, records of Stoicism, Mm -hmm. probably the most famous record of Stoicism, which is the meditations. Well, what kind of stuff would they do when you were in the military? Yeah, again, the whole, the training aspect of it is they put you under these stressful situations, especially not only as an individual, but as a team. As a group. As a group. Because on top of stress inoculation, they're also trying to teach teamwork. They're also trying to uh, watch and check for uh, gleans of leadership, you know, because during the process of this happening, they're going, wow, look how that guy's handling the stress. He's calm under pressure. He's able to still operate and lead. What so, about Seer, Mike? Is that... I'm not, I'm not too familiar. Seer happened after I already got oh, out. So, after? Yeah. yeah. But all these situations there where, where they're able to stress inoculate, 
uh, build teamwork and also develop le leaders out of that. Because again, how can you really assess who the leaders in that group are going to be until you put them under those situations, those conditions to see those things come out? Because th the cream is going to rise to the top, correct? Yeah. So they're able to watch in the net. But a part of that process is to put you under. That way, when a stressful situation comes on, it's like, it's not the first time you felt that. It's not the first time you experienced that. You can glean from that experience and not get all weird when it comes to stress. Cause, and the other aspect of it, too, is you're going to find people who are unable to deal with mm -hmm. that stress. Do you want to find that out in the combat field? And get them a little. Out. It's a little late for that. We've got to find that out now. So the weeding out process of putting people under that pressure, who can handle it, who can't, that guy's a... Uh, you know, that guy's not going to be able to handle it, get him out. I have a question for you, Sensei. I mean, one of the things that I remember when, uh, you know, studying uh, Hagakure and some of the other things, th this also comes from um, the, the Templars, is that, you know, you see some of the paintings and um, artifacts from the Templars that they would keep the skull yeah. uh, on the desk. And my understanding is, and, and I'm not a really a scholar of the Templars, I can talk about the ancient Greeks and the Romans all day long, but... You, you probably know this too. Is that my understanding is that the, the, the Templars would keep the skull uh, on their desk so that every day, like almost entirely every moment, that they have a reminder that they're going to die. Mm. And that when they see the skull, it removes the fear of death because they're always contemplating death. And my understanding is, is that um, at least for some of the samurai class, there is this also a very similar meditation going on where you're supposed to meditate on your um, your death to transcend your death in your, in your action. Is, is, is that something that... Not, not necessarily is the same thing as maybe that. It's that the, you know, the Japanese are very, at that time were very harsh people, mm -hmm. right? The, they live in a very agricultural society. So if the crops fail, you all die, right? right? The, the winters in Japan are very harsh. Very harsh. Right? So you have to learn, you know, you think about how Japanese people are very um, homogenous conservative. and conservative and, you know, one mind, hive mind type thinking is because it have to be. Right. A rice field can't be harvested by one or two people. Right. So Community. the community comes together, harvests it, and they go to the next guy's farm and the next guy's farm and they all work together. You know, one person doesn't get away with having had their farm harvest their their crops harvested and then not gone to the next person's right, thing, right? right? And so, if you look at that, look at look at Japanese society today. There's a lot of reciprocity. Omiyage bringing the gift back home from you go off to Chicago and then you bring back like frozen hot dogs or like a pen that looks like a hot dog for everybody in the office to say, look, I might have been away and enjoying myself, but I still think of you, right? Right, and so. <clears throat> You have this idea that, you know, it's it's a very harsh place to live. And so, you know, the the one thing you have, which is your – every person has is which their asset is, is their life. Right. And so that that's why you see a lot of people killing themselves today still. Oh, I made a mistake. I just killed myself. Oh, I have to atone for my son's uh, – my son killed all these people. I, I atone by killing myself. And then everyone goes, oh, yeah. And then they don't hold a grudge because, you know, they atoned. But that's that. So, like, you know, death in the, in the, you know, classical warrior cultures, right, you're so close to the edge. When you fought this battle and, you know, all these people died, you almost died, you understand where the line is. Right. And so for the samurai, you know, I would imagine it was one of those things where, you know, well, you have to, you can't really think about it from a samurai standpoint. You have to just think about it from a Japanese cultural standpoint, right? The Japanese have this idea of shogunai or shikateganai, which just means it can't be helped. Right. So you go, Bill, <clears throat> you know, um, your car just exploded. You just go, oh, shogunai. Right. But what can you do about it? So right. just go buy another one or you go do something else. Oh, you're, the, all the crops failed. You don't dwell. Right, you just move on. Yeah, you know, like when I was talking to Furu Sensei about the uh, World War II, and you know all the all the internment camps for the Japanese Americans and things like that, I go, oh, but Sensei, tell me, tell me all about it. The first thing he said was, "It's Shogunai." Right, can't be helped. Got 
no sense worrying about the milk that spilled, just clean it up. It got spilled, that's Shogun Ai. You just clean it up. You just move on with, with that. It, you deal with the hardship. You know, if you look at all these different things about Japanese culture, ninja, you know, nin, nin, nin is uh, to bear, to endure. But that's also, nin is also the way to say patience hmm. in Japanese, to endure the hardship, to be patient. And right, and so this idea between life and death is not, it's it's a very cultural thing, you know, like, like someone said, oh, didn't all samurai studies end? No, not really. There's some that study Tendai, Christianity, Zen, or Buddhism in general. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, but they all have like the central theme of Buddhism, except for Christianity, of course. And so you're thinking about this idea of life and death. Buddhism is very... Um, it, it pairs very well with the warrior culture. With warrior ethic, yeah. You know, that you know, you have to learn to become nothing so that you can become something. Yeah. And so it's the same thing you're talking about. It's like these stressors. You you learn to deal with these stressors, right? But if you look at a, almost every warrior culture, maybe not Middle Eastern ones, but maybe even then, I don't know, they all are into drinking alcohol. <laughs> Or some type of fermented beverage. So maybe the way they deal with it is to is to drink is to forget by drinking. You know, I mean, you bring up Buddhism, and it seems to me that one of the interesting things about uh, dealing with stress, because Jackie's kind of talking about like the war. She used the word chaos. Is um, you know, our our, our teacher was a uh, Soto Zen um, teacher, but I mean, he didn't teach us a lot of Zen. I mean. He didn't teach much about it, but the, the little bit I understand about it, the, the, what may be attractive to uh, the warrior class about Zen is you can't let, like if you're doing sword or even Aikido, you can't let, you can't get your mind get stuck on things. And it seems to me that to what I understand about Zen is it, it, it very much doesn't want your mind to get stuck. Right. In, in swordsmanship, they call it the non-abiding mind. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. In Buddhism, they call it equanimity. Right. And I think that that's a, that, that's a real connection point for sword and Aikido and Zen, having a, a real collaborative um, mental effort that would work in, in a situation of chaos. Because if, if you get into chaos and you're feeling that swirling around and all of a sudden you're like, ah, you're, you're done. Well, and that's what we're talking, what Mike was talking about in terms of uh, stress inoculation. Right. Is that when, when I was a student, the do this dojo was very stressful. Oh. <laughs> I mean, and we're, not, we're not even talking about stepping on the mat. Just in general. Just the thought of like, Driving oh. to the dojo, you're like, oh, oh, I remember. And, you know, and that you would have to do all these things to manage the stressful environment that Furu Sensei created so that you could just learn to let it go. So when it was time to act, you could just act. Right. But the the inoculation, oh, those shots were hard. I mm -hmm. mean, like when I was a student, there was a time where when we had a six thirty class, I would drink uh, sixty four ounces of water at two o'clock, and take two Advil, which I don't. You shouldn't do that because it ruined my stomach. But uh, drinking the water, the reason why you drank that water is because there was no water at the dojo. Right. There were no water breaks. Right. But the reason why I drank it at 2 o'clock is because there were no bathrooms at oh, the yeah. dojo. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and at that time, downtown LA was a was bad. Right. Yeah. Nowhere to go. <laughs> there was no place to go. You had to, you know, eat eat at Denny's down the street in order to get the chance to use the restroom. You had to cozy up to the people at the – when the, when there was finally a cafe next to the dojo, you had to co cozy up with the people there and use the restroom. Mm -hmm. You had to do all these things, but that made you think ahead of time because you didn't want it, there to be a situation where you went, oh, I have to use the restroom, and then have to go knock on Sensei's door and be like, pardon me, Sensei, may I use your restroom, which he's fine with, but to pass through his office huge stress. caused you to him to go, why did you get a haircut? You should shave your beard off. You, you know, yeah, and then opens like, you up to everything. everything. <laughs> so you're like, no thanks. Mm -hmm. And so you prepared yourself ahead of time. So that stress inoculation, right, is that you – and then when you went there, you couldn't be like, I'm having a bad day. No. Because when you had a bad day and you brought it to the dojo, Sensei would sense it and then 
pounce go, on you, go off on you, mm-hmm. yeah. and then you'd be yelling at you, throwing you down, and then you're just like, uh, so you had to learn to instantly let it go when you got to the dojo because whatever you bring with you is like you know they when came, Luke goes came like, at you yeah, yeah when Luke goes into the cave he asks Yoda what's in there and Yoda says whatever you bring with you right right and so. <clears throat> That's why Furio Sensei always talks about before you enter the dojo, cut off your head and leave it outside mm-hmm, the door. Yeah, yeah. Because when you came in, Sensei's BS was enough. To bring your own BS in, <laughs> yeah, much. I, I'm having a bad day at work. <laughs> no one cares. <laughs> oh, my well. God. It's, it's, it's so interesting to say that because uh, as you're talking, everything that keeps coming to my mind is the landmines of the dojo were the almost the biggest training component And they were of the everywhere. Dojo. And you could you could you could tripwire yourself five times in an hour. Yeah, and then if you go into his office, the the landmines are per. It's not per square foot; it's per square inch. Mm. And then you're standing there, and then you ask. He asked, and then the worst thing he could do is ask you for a favor. Oh, Bill, can you change the water bottle yeah, in my office? A disaster. Oh gosh, you go there. The water bottle's got a change holder that since he's collecting change, it's got all these papers. It's got all the stuff um, uh, magnet magnetized to the the water dispenser, and then you have to like Move take it. it all off. And sometimes the bottle's not fully out right, of water right so you have to pull the bottle out and not spill a drop of water because if you spill a drop of water what are you doing you're so, and then you, oh, so you have to like do it real fast and then you have to get a bottle of water and then you have to l- know how to drop it in without dropping a drop of water because again you drop a drop of water what are you doing you're so uncommon and you're like and then put everything back exactly yeah. the way. You had to learn how to put my change back. And then, like one time, we were um, cleaning the dojo, and since he had all these these plates displayed downstairs on top of this tansu right here, actually, and um, I took a picture of it with when oh, camera yeah. phones first I, came out. Yeah. And then we cleaned the dojo, and we're putting it back, and we're all looking at the picture. And since he goes, "What is that? Why and do you I, need to look at the picture?" Yeah, yeah. he goes, "Turn that off." <laughs> Delete that picture, and I'm like, but we don't remember. And you say, and then that's your problem. And that yeah, yeah. And you should have you should have seen it, known, and you don't need that that crutch. Right. So like, you have to be able to look, and take a picture with your mind, and then no, it goes like this, this, this. And if you didn't, he would get mad. Be like, you place don't go that way. And then you're <laughs> like, I don't know anything about Japanese ceramics to know that the Yoshitoshi is supposed to be the Yoshi cow. Oh man. And then you just, but then that. That stress that he inoculated you with in that moment made you be able to look at something and take a picture with your mind and got it. Right. As opposed to, I don't know which one is what. It right. would sh- it would just sharpen you. You yeah. just became – and then it all, I don't know about you, but it almost developed a sixth sense that you would not have developed if – you like you walk up the door and you're like, I sense uh, yeah. this. Yeah, yeah. This kind of energy or whatever, it got you really tuned in. Or was it PTSD? Maybe that too. (laughs) We don't know. I mean, the things that I do today in my own life are echo from those times. That's the 17 years I trained under Furu Sensei to where I go, oh, I should, you know, before I came here, I packed all my bags, put them in front of the door so that I I wouldn't wake up my family at 5 o'clock in the morning. And load my car quietly. And even today, I forgot something. Yeah. And I was kicking myself all the way. Oh, I can't believe I forgot that thing. But the reason why you don't put it in your car the night before is that what if your car gets broken into? And then all your stuff gets stolen. Mm-hmm. So you don't do that either. So you have to be more than diligent. A diligent person might put it all in the car the night before. But if their car is outside like mine, then your car could get broken into you, and then you're going to lose all your stuff. So you have to stage it by the door, no matter how much stuff that you're going to bring. Right. And you can't. I can't open my garage door. I might wake up my kids, and then my wife's going to be pissed. So you have to always be thinking ahead, ahead, ahead. One more, one more, one more. Right. So Furia Sensei's training, it was so stressful. He would push you, like a regular person's life. You know, maybe they're prepared five steps, but in training under Furia Sensei, you had to be prepared seven, eight, nine, maybe fifteen. Right. Right. They say the average. Uh, I think what was it? The average uh, chess player thinks five steps ahead, but like a grand champion thinks up to uh, fifteen to twenty steps ahead, oh. right? And you go, whoa, how many steps ahead? But then that's what that stress inoculation is supposed to do for you. That you know ahead of time, your bag. You should pack your bag 
so that in the morning you could just grab it and run, not go have to go through the whole thing of where's it, what's in my bag, where's my bag, and then you forget something because you're tired. Yeah. Right? You know, and that that's really, really hard for people to do because no one wants to live that way. Right? Well, it's a scam. It's kind of thing just down to like in the military changing your – you're changing your socks out in the field, right? You don't take both your boots off, change your socks, and put your boots back. You take one boot off, change the sock, lace it all back up, then, then go the ahead one. because you never want to be caught <clears> – <throat> With both your boots off, if this shit ever hits. Well, that that's actually what was a free since he, you know, he had all these like we, he had all these unspoken rules. Like one of the rules is that you're never fully naked in the dressing room. You always and I. It's funny because sometimes I'll see some of the older guys, uh, seniors, do the same thing. Is that when they dress, they take their lowers off first, put put their lowers on, and then take their uppers off. So they're never fully naked. And that's uh, uh, that was a free sensei method, but that's not something he said. All right, everybody gather around. This is what you should do. Mm-hmm. Right. He mentioned it in passing, and everyone went. That's what we're going to do. Right. You didn't um, take off your clothes fully. You took off your shirt first, put your uwagi on first. You took your pants off, and then put your zubon on, and then you tied everything up. So that if you ever had to run out of the dressing room, you would be half clothed. Right. And then someone told me, which I don't know if this is true, that it comes from a Miyamoto Musashi story, where the reason why Miyamoto Musashi supposedly didn't bathe was because in uh, Eiji Yoshikawa's book Musashi, he was uh, he was taking a bath and attacked by the by some people, and so that's why he never bathed because he never wanted to be caught off guard. Off guard, yeah, right. But like, since he never said, "All right, everybody, this is what you're going to do." You saw someone get in trouble, and then you <laughs> changed your method to reflect that thing so that you wouldn't get in trouble. Like one time, the student showed up to a demonstration without a hakama, oh, without a hakama. and panicked, drove someplace to buy a hakama, and then drive back, and then you went, oh, I never want that to happen. And so now, after that point, I always kept a full set of old uniforms in, your- behind, in, my, in my truck behind the seat always so that if i had to break out the pants top hakama anything i at least had something and wouldn't get in trouble because you couldn't show up without a uniform oh yeah not only that if you got the call from sensei and you happen to be down in long beach and you couldn't drive all the way home to go get your uniform he's like hey i need you up here right now and then boom you were you had your gear ready to rock and roll yeah and then that's that's the thing like if you can't you can't tell someone to be like that. Like today, if someone shows up without their hakama, I just go, "Oh my gosh, you're so ridiculous!" And then just train. Those days, you would, you would, you would quietly go around. Hey, anybody got a Extra hakama? hakama? Anybody got a hakama? And yeah, then, it's like and it, it, it would come down. You need to turn in your black belt too. It's like, the, the, oh my god, like you have to hear you all would that. Catch all kinds of head. yeah. So like you know, there was a time where um, before I was I was a black belt, and when I was a black belt or when I was a student, you couldn't buy your own hakama and you weren't allowed to buy your own black belt. Right, Those I things, that. Your first one was bestowed upon you by the teacher. Right. So for six months to a year, I didn't have a black belt or a hakama. And then one day the student goes, just wear one of mine. It just gives me oh. a hakama. Ooh. <laughs> so I come downstairs and of course I'm not wearing it properly. <laughs> and then Sensei just goes, what do you think you're doing? I go, uh, that guy said to wear it. He goes, you know, you can just get your own hakama. Hamon, which means kick, you know, excommunicate. Hamon, two weeks kicked out. Really? And I was like, oh my god! And then like me and the guy are like taking off our uniforms and then leaving after the we had just right then and there didn't even get to start class. Just got kicked out for two weeks. And then the guys are like, I'm sorry, well, dude, I don't want to hear it. It's all right. It's okay. I shouldn't have listened to you. You know. And then afterwards, since he's like, what do you listen to that person for? And I'm like, I, I don't know, Sensei. Like. He made a compelling argument. He made a compelling <laughs> argument. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. But but that's the thing is that like <clears throat> stress inoculation is about how you develop your warrior's mindset. So if you read a lot of uh, David Goggins stuff, you know, the mm-hmm. former Navy SEAL, that guy, he, all his entire book's all about stress inoculation. Stress inoculations and mind hacks. Yeah. And it's funny because we would do those same mind hacks as well when we were when we were students. You know, like um, – that sambazuke or something like that, or I th- I'm not sure if that's the right word for it, but it's the it's the old judo maxim: you train one, I'll train three. Right. Right. You do uh, you do 50 push-ups, I'll do 100. 
you do 10 pull-ups, I'll do 200 pull-ups, you know, all that craziness that people used to do back in the day that to try to beat someone. So like supposedly that, that, that Masahiko Kimura, that famous Kimura, famous Kimura's, judo guy, uh, judo, yeah. he would do 900 push-ups a day, <sighs> right? And then you think, dude, this guy was so strong. His Osotogari, his outside sweep, leg sweep, supposedly in training, he would give people concussions. <laughs> and it got to a point where they had to ask him to not to, to go easy <laughs> not, no not use that technique in training because too many people were getting, getting concussions yeah you know but like you he lived that spartan quote-unquote spartan lifestyle yeah where you you know even i think i'm not sure if it was like uh, mr t in rocky three or one of these movies where he's like you know i don't have any flunkies in my corner i sleep in i sleep in a, a, a you know in a basement on a on cold a floor on a cold floor but then you need that yeah right you need to have that element which grounds you and makes you hungry because the worst thing that can happen is that you get soft and you stop being hungry you don't have that warrior's mindset to overcome that moment when you can't go any farther and, and you, that and that that edge i think comes into our daily lives now even even if you're not a, a warrior literally carrying a rifle or you're you're in a competition ring i mean i i feel that in my own work but people don't think it like that yeah. you have to think about it in that sense where you know you have your pens all lined up you know because so when you just grab it, you grab a pen you don't have to go where's a pen where's a pen right you know you know where the paper in the copy machine is all stocked up so right. that when you have to print something it gets you can print it right away you're preparing yourself to succeed but because you're not we're not fighting people just go oh it's just whatever you know they say like the average person once they become distracted it takes them 12 minutes to get back on track 12 minutes 12 minutes Damn. so when you stop to read a text or stop to read an email while you're doing something it could take your mind a long time to to re refocus re yeah and then that's the thing is that like the old days when i was a student i didn't need to warm up because once I rolled and my head touched the mat, my body instantly relaxed, became flexible, and I was ready to go. Right. I didn't need to be like, oh, I got to stretch my back, you know, that type. There was no that thing. Because when we were students. You had to go right away. If you were late and you came on the mat, sensei would be like, oh, you can, you can uh, warm up. But that was a trick. <laughs> because while you're warming up, you're spending all this time warming up. He's like, like, how long is it going to take? Let's go. <laughs> and you're like, well, you said warm up. So then you came in late. You just went right in and trained. Yeah. Warmed up while you're get while you're doing. While you were training. Yeah. You know. And you didn't. You could. You could. He said you could warm up. But you really couldn't. But then the whole time he's staring at you, and you're like, oh, I better. You just get on the. How mat. long is this guy going to take? Yeah. <laughs> or you know he gets about at you because you're taking too long. So I have a question for for both of you, which is. Um, because we've been talking about training and martial arts and all these things in other podcasts, and this I think this topic is I'm I'm really glad Jackie asked us this question, but this this brings up another question, which is how do you do this kind of training now? It seems like it's very very hard because we're we're all reminiscing and we went through all this and I think we all benefited really well and and is it's had all these amazing collateral effects in our careers and our personal lives and in our keto and our martial arts. But how do we how do we train other people? Like Jackie asked this question, so she must be feeling the need for this kind of training. Um, so how do we train people without being masochists? Well, you have to search for the uncomfortable. So one time when I was doing a hot, I did a lot of hot yoga for a while, I would get there early enough to get to choose my, be able to be the first person to choose my spot. And I would look for the, the heating vent, put it down, and the guy came over. He's like, you know that's the hottest spot in the... And he's like, yeah. Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I do know that. But see, like, then that didn't really serve me because I was f competing so strongly with the other people in the class and the heat and all that stuff. I hurt myself. Hmm. Right? So that's not part of it either. So you have... It's hard because you have to kind of search for ways to improve yourself and be uncomfortable or be uncomfortable and improve yourself. Yeah. You know, it's putting out, packing all your clothes the night before enables you to be prepared, you know, and that's where the, you know, that this thing becomes where someone the other day asked me like, oh, what time do you wake up in the morning? And I said five. 
And the person said, oh, wow, man, you're really driven. And I go, not really. If I was driven, I would wake up at 4.30. I naturally wake up at 5. That's easy. So if it's e anything that's easy, you must be make it hard some way. Like when I was a student, they uh, we would train really hard before class so that you're we completely exhausted and then you take the class mm. so that you would know what it's like to train exhausted. Yeah. Or one time I was stretching before class and oh, I pulled a muscle on my back. And I was like, oh, I'm just going to go home. The other, one of the other students goes, nah, man, you should train. Then you could feel what it feels like to train injured. And I was like, okay. <laughs> you know, and you're training, you're like, every time you roll, you're like, oh, oh, every time you move, oh. Yeah. But then you, got, you understood what it would take. Like there's a famous story of Tiger Woods. Uh, there, you know, he played at Stanford. He played golf at Stanford. And there was a really bad, you know, rainstorm. And he was going out there with a bucket of balls. And someone goes, hey, man, it's, going, it's raining really hard out there. And he goes, yeah, I know. He's like, and the gusts are crazy. So guys in Tiger Woods is like, I know. I want to know what this is like. Hmm, interesting. Right? So then when he goes and plays at the you know British Open. And it's crappy weather. Experience that same conditions. He goes like, oh, yeah, I've been here before. Because I've been there before, I become familiar. Yeah. And then, like you said, you're inoculated from that stress. And you can go, I, I get what it's like. It's not a shock to your system. You know, and that's one of the reasons, like, when I, the, my whole entire journey of self-discovery began in this class I took when I was, uh, like, 19 years old, 18 or 19 years old at PCC. It was a sports performance class. And this guy talked about all these different techniques to improve yourself self-development-wise. And he told a story about the uh, L.A. County Fire Department is really hard to get into. You have to score 100 on the um, oral exam to even be go to the next level, 100. So he wanted to test this theory where he used visualization. So he went through the whole process, got it, passed all the tests, got 100 on everything, and got to the um, uh, oral exam. The, a couple days before the oral exam, he goes to the place where it's supposed to be held, and he talks to the janitor, and the janitor lets him in to see the room. He scopes out the room, gets the lay of the land, and then goes back and visualizes the interview, and then takes the interview and gets 100. And then he just dropped out after that. But it was he wanted to see, see if, if he, could do it. he could use visualization, right? But by going to that place, that enabled him to – stress inoculate wow. because he at least saw the the setup because it's always the same you go oh there's gonna be a guy there i'll be sitting here okay so i'll know what it's about that's the same reason why people should come and watch the black belt test if, if they're if they're not a black belt because they see it and they go they're stress inoculating oh that's the format this is what it's about okay well i don't need to freak out I, now i know where to bow and how to bow okay i know how to do these things your stress inoculating, right? So you you put yourself into these environments that are uncomfortable, so that you can grow, right? Yeah. So what how what do you want to grow? How you want to if if uh, Watanabe Sensei makes you do a thousand suburi in class, it's really really hard. But if you did a thousand suburi every day, it a thousand be hard. a thousand suburi be like eh, no yeah, big deal. There. Like one time Sensei got mad at us, and he said he told the person teaching the class. All ukemi, no technique. Oh, yeah, we talked about that. And then, so we had roll, we had a break fall, backward roll, forward roll, but, and I, the whole time I was like, this is so easy. And I was like laughing to myself. The guy's like, 50 handshake break falls. I was like, no all right, problem. Let's go. I have my break falls pretty smooth. 50 break falls, rolls, all these different things. At the end of the class, people were dying. Cast out. And I was like, this, that was so easy. I was like laughing to myself. This is so easy. Right. Because I had done so much ukemi prior to this time and my ukemi technique was good so then it's not that uncomfortable for me right but if sensei would have like said two hours or three hours or you know do this or something that i'm not accustomed to maybe he would have dragged me out into open waters where it's really deep and then i would have drowned right. but then how many people would have drowned before we got there well right? that goes into a whole other area is part of the whole condition aspect of being in the military is it eliminates that physical stressor. There's all kinds of different stressors happening, but the more physically conditioned you are, that eliminates one of the 
possible stressors. Right. That way you can address the other ones. Because if you have this stress on top of this stress on top of this stress, your chances of success dwindle. But if we could, okay, let's eliminate the physical stress. You're highly conditioned. Okay, that's less of a factor in this scenario. Yeah, what's your favorite uh, Patton quote? Uh, I have several of them. But, yeah, he's he's all about training. Yeah, well, fatigue makes cowards of us all. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean that that was my first answer to Jackie's question, which was, you know, what how do you how does samurai or how does anyone prepare for war and chaos? And I think this would be Mike's answer and probably your answer too and mine is it's just training. You have to consistently train for conflict. Whether it's mental training, physical training or a combination thereof, you have to consistently prepare for conflict and, and war and chaos. You have to you have to train for it and prepare. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, you guys might think about it as a, you got to train for it, which is true. And then I also, as an Aikido teacher, add another layer, which is, if it scares you, face it. Right. You know, the monk, the monk Ryokan said that, like, if you're scared, face it. If you're going to die, face it. If death stalks you, face it. Right. You, whatever you, whatever your fear confront is, it. Get, confront it. Get comfortable with the uncomfortable. Yeah. And so, like, you know, you sleep with a, a tennis ball on your leg or in your back and it's so uncomfortable so that you know what it's like yeah. to be uncomfortable i totally agree i think that that's you know going back to the romans i mean they they really believe that um emotion like fear which is an emotion but any of these emotions that they literally are almost like outside forces coming into you and that they destroy your ability to act and that you have to learn to control yourself and then you learn to control yourself by training by as mike is talking about and you're talking about by putting yourself in situations where you experience the negative emotions you learn to train to keep them at bay and then that allows you to make good decisions and under adverse conditions which in jackie's questions is what she says war and chaos that you know whatever that training is and in our in our case the training is aikido right i mean we're 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 an aikido school and a yaido school well, when that's when you train and train, you train on the days you don't want to train. If you train, if Jerry West said, if you train on the days, only trained on the days that you wanted to, you would never train. Right. Never practice. So that's that thing, right? Like you have to confront something and make it uncomfortable. You could go to the dojo on this day, but you really don't feel like it. Well, got to do it. That's the day. That's the day to do it. That should be your deciding factor whether you go or not. I don't want to go. Well, today's the day. <laughs> and, and for instance, he said, those days are the days that matter the most. Right. The days when you want to go, he said, don't matter at all. Right. But it's the day you don't want to go. That matters. That matter. That you get the most growth from. Because you had to overcome your mindset to, you know, you go, I, you know, I don't want to go tonight. What? The Broncos are playing the, oh, well, you know what? This is a once at a time, and you know they've. Well, you know, and you talk yourself into it, and just as you talk yourself into not going, you have to talk yourself into going. Right. You know, and that's where David Goggins has all these little um, mind hacks. Yeah. You know, every chapter in his bo his book is those are just stories about his mind hack and how he learned that mind hack. We do all that all the time. You know. Um, taking their souls is that when I was a student and I would see at, at, during a seminar and I'd see people getting all tired at the end, <laughs> very end of the seminar when everyone's like You're tanking like, I'd last class trash them. or or at the end of the class, I'd start breaking fall, break fall. Boom. And the people just, their faces would just be like, because they're dying, and here right. you are turning it up a notch. Fresh as a daisy. Turning it up to <laughs> 11. Mean, do you remember Sensei when the, in the, um, in in the seminars, the old day seminars, where we'd have like over three days, like thirteen classes, and the last class, since they would turn the jets on, in the very last one. Yeah, and I would just start going as hard and fast as I could, just just to destroy people. Yeah, that's the David Goggins taking their souls. Yeah, I would remember that he would make the last class the hardest class of the whole seminar, and people would be like, "You gotta be kidding me!" No, <clears throat> actually, you're talking about the second to last class. Was it the second to the last yeah. class? I always taught the last class. And then, don't you remember? Sensei would leave, and I'd be like, all right, everybody, we're not going to go crazy. And they'd do like 20 minutes of stretching. <laughs> just make it super. I'm like, no one needs to die today. Yeah. Just let's turn let's turn it down a little bit. But <clears throat> but then, you know, when I now that I think about it, that's wrong. So I had this patient um, come in yesterday. And I last time I saw her was three years ago. 
And three years ago, I saw her one time. And then she came back three years later. And I was like, okay. So then she's like, oh, you, you talked to me about this and that. And so we started talking about metaphysical stuff. Mm -hmm. And I said, is this pain, you know, from an injury or is it, what do you think? And she's like, oh, I think it's, you know, emotional. And I went, oh, so we, and she's a trauma expert. She has a PhD in educational leadership with an emphasis in trauma. Trauma. Wow. <clears throat> and so we, I started working on her, doing all these different things. And then I went, I'm going to stop right here. And she's like, you're going to stop right here? And I go, yeah. I go, We're not, I'm not going to go any farther. I probably could grind this, this muscle out and help mm -hmm. you, but I'm not going to. And she's like, why not? I'm all, because I don't want to rob you. This, if you think this thing is here to teach you something, if I alleviate this thing, you're not going to learn. And I don't want to rob you of that. And so I'm not going to uh, fix you. Here are the things you can do to, to help that thing. And two to three weeks of being diligent, it should be fine. But all the, the, whole, all the time you have to kind of say to yourself, well, I got to let go of this right. emotional problem that I'm having. <clears throat> But the point of the whole story is that I didn't want to rob her. So now that I think back on me letting you guys off the hook on the very last class of the seminars, I was robbing you. That's wrong. Interesting. What I should have done is turn it up. Made you guys all push yourselves to the limit, throw up, so that you can you can confront your demon on the mat. Right. Right, because on the mat, who comes out? The teacher, the talker, the fake injury guy, <laughs> the you know, the, all these all these <laughs> weird little things come out that you do to not train. Hey, so where are you from? You right. know, or oh my, uh, I gotta sit out. My butt hurts. Um, or, or the guy, well, you're not doing it right. Let me show you how to do it. All those people show me. Ah, uh, whenever people do that on the mat today, I go, oh, uh, there's their weakness coming out. Right. You know, but that's that. Maybe I robbed those people when I didn't teach that class that way because, and maybe that's, I'm still doing that today as I make the classes easier for this, that, or other thing. I should, no, man, this is Just your, this is your opportunity to push yourself and confront your demon, whatever your demon it is. Your demon is to quit. Don't quit. Confront it. Your, your demon is to throw up. Don't swallow it. You can swallow that throw up. No, you can't. There was a guy in high school that would go. <laughs> And they just swallow it back after ah, when you're when drinking. <laughs> but you know the thing is, he never threw up, right? But right. that's so. I mean, you have to confront your demon. My demon is to quit. My demon is to this. My demon is to get mad. My demon is to you say no. Okay, the training's hard, but it's just physical. Right. The stuff that's coming up on the mat, that's my. That's the test. Oh, I'm. So you're talking angry. about. You're saying that like. Everything that we've been talking about, when it comes out in this really, really hard training, it's almost like the chaos is in our mind. Like the real chaos is in our mind. It is all mindset. It's all mindset. Yeah. It is this everything about you and this everything you do is all about mind. Yeah. Mind mindset, mind hacking, talking your mind into doing it, talking your mind into not doing it. I should eat apple pie. I don't even like apple pie, but, you know, I haven't had apple pie in so long. I should probably have it. And Grandma used to make apple pie all the time. And, you know, I used to be the blah, 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 and I had apple pie. I thought you were on a diet. I know, but it was apple pie. It's just it's just a mind hack. And so you have to, like, you know, it's like that uh, episode of diversity, um the dodgeball with uh, Vince Vaughn. Oh, and, yeah. And, you know, uh, Ben Stiller's characters, like, spelling the pizza, you know, <laughs> trying to tempt himself and shocking himself every time he goes, he wants the pizza. You have to do that. Yeah. Because there's no other way for you to change and improve yourself if you don't, if you're not uncomfortable. And then, yeah. you know, this is not very PC, especially in today's lifestyles, that suffering is the only way for to create change. yeah. And so that's why I told that lady, I'm not going to take this away from you. You right. need to work through this. Yeah. And then she was like, okay, I will. You know, she's a trauma specialist. She, she knows I'm, it, it, I was it right. It seems to me like with martial arts, though, we're, we're in kind of a, a difficult situation in the present cultural environment because, as you say, it's a very uncomfortable, painful <coughs> experience. It's not... It's not. It's not a happy place. It maybe not. It's maybe not a horrible place, but it's not a happy place where you go to learn these lessons. Well, that's the thing where, the and that's the thing I'm trying to create today in the, this dojo. The harshness 
stays on the mat, mm. but the community is stays around it. Stays around it and is comfortable and and generous and friendly and all those things, but the harshness is just stays localized. on the mat. Yeah, right. And so this is something that we were talking about the other day, which is Aikido is not medicine. Right. Dojo is not medicine. The teacher is not the savior. It's the training which changes you. Right. You got a problem, put yourself, throw yourself into training, and the problem will go away or fix itself. Right. So there's a famous thing called in Japan called the pilgrimage of the 99 temples. So whenever you had a problem, you go to this priest, he would say, take the pilgrimage of the 99 temples. So you have to go visit these 99 temples. Right. The, the pilgrimage of the 99 temples takes 12 years. So you got a problem with the girl? Take the, the, the pilgrimage well, the, of the 99 the, temples. This is very similar to what you and I were talking about with uh, um, Carl Jung saying that you don't necessarily solve a problem, you outgrow. Right, and so by the time you get back of 12 years, it's over that with. girl that you were having a problem with, that bully you were having a problem with, the harvest you were having a problem with, those things are all gone. What yeah. girl? <laughs> yeah, she's she's older yeah. and married now, so there's no problem. But you, but that's that thing, right? Like, if obviously they don't want you to just run away from your problems, but it's that you have to put yourself into something positive, which creates change. Yeah, I I think that makes a lot of sense. So, how do you do that in today's climate? The, t the today's climate's no different than a hundred years, five hundred years, a thousand years. It's all the same, right? I think it was Heraclitus, even though Jacob said it's probably not. But it, Heraclitus said, with a <clears throat> a group of hundred warriors. Uh, 20, 10 shouldn't even be there. 10 or 20 shouldn't even be there. 70 or 80% of those people are just fodder. 10% of those people are are fighters, but only one of those fighters is a true warrior. Yeah. It's the same thing as it is today. It just seems different because of the internet and all that stuff. There are still people out there that want to push themselves. I mean, look at CrossFit, right? I mean, people are like giving their, themselves rabidosis and dying yeah. because they're training so hard. So the training, the, the desire to train is out there, right? We just have to kind of create a situation where they can understand that the harshness of the training stays on the mat. Right. But then there's still this social structure where it's generous, kind, fun. But not just this place where people are beating the crap out of you and whispering in your ear, <laughs> you're not a no one. You're, never, you're not a, uh, you're a has-been. You're a never-was-been. <laughs> <laughs> I'd actually said that to someone. That's why I say that. But, and that's rude. That right. was rude, right? That's you know. So that's the hard part is that that we have to replace the bully culture of, right. of martial arts with the harshness of training. Right. In the old days, you would the the, the teacher would be, would be your enemy. And you were trying to defeat the teacher because the teacher was so cruel. You're like, I'm going to beat this person at their own game. Right. But today, that's not really healthy either. Right? So you have to make it about the physicalness of the training, which creates the harshness and the suffering, which enables you to grow. You know, if you, you said, man, I would never be able to throw Mike Van Ruth down. And then one day I did, then I, after that I realized I can throw anyone down. Right. You know, but then if you never confront, you always run away from Michael Van Ruth. How like are you going to grow? How are you going to climb that mountain? Right. Right? You have to... One must uh, dance with the devil to know the devil type thing, and then you you try this person on. Yeah, you know. So I mean, I don't know if they do that in the military, where they you you have they they give you a goal which is, seems you know unsurmountable, and then when you achieve that goal, you're like, wow, I can do anything. Yeah, there's always these areas to get over, and I I, I think from my experience, I I grew up in a as a young man in a, an environment where it's like. Well, go do that. Go do that. So, again, we were talking about before stress inoculation. It's like, hey, go do that. And you had to do it. And it's like, so when the next task comes along, you've built onto that confidence. Go, well, I think I can do that. I've done this, that, and the other. But building those, those points of I've overcome this, I've overcome that, you know, the next task doesn't seem so insurmountable because you have a track record of meeting a situation and overcoming it. What's the 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 talented the, the talented student mm. where where you're you're good you're physically good at everything and then once you reach an actual obstacle and you're like oh 
and then you, and you you fail because yeah, you run out of talent. Er, you run out of talent. Everything was easy, but you never had to really come up against any kind of obstacle and have to overcome that. And then you, yeah. but again, it's all mindset. Yeah. So I mean, if this everything we we think about in this side, well, this we go back to Jackie's question, right? Right. Jackie's question is really about mindset. How do you overcome X? You know, how do you kill people and overcome that? How do you um, lose, a, lose a loved one and overcome that? You know, this lady who came to me, she had lost a daughter. And so wow. we, had to, we had to kind of talk about that too, right? But it's that all these things are but distractions from the way, right? Oh, I, I you know, I, can't, I cut my little finger. I can't come to class today. There's a, there's a thumbtack in the road. I can't come to class today. Or I don't feel like it today. Or my husband and I got in a fight over this today. Yeah. That I still have to go and I still have to over overcome. You still have to confront. What is, it all comes down to why. Why do you feel this way? How do I deal with the fact that I got to, think about the, the warrior's mindset. You're training for something which may or may not ever, ever, ever happen. That, that is, I think, one of the hardest things. For many students, they'll train their entire life. Never use it. Never, never use, use it. it. Right? But that's the difference between getting dressed for battle and being prepared for battle. The the barbarians are at the gate. You get dressed and you go fight. You don't prepare and start doing push-ups right before that, right? You should have been doing push-ups way, way, way before that. So it becomes down to this mindset of developing yourself at all, any and all times. Yeah. You know, can I drive, get to the dojo faster? Can I take this route and see, I've never, I've got an extra 20 minutes. I've never driven this route. I'll drive this route to see what it's like. So if I ever have to do it, you know, I'll know what it's like. Oh, I hurt my back, so I have to go to a chiropractor, even though I don't believe in chiropractic. Maybe there's something there, right? But it's all why, why, why? Why do you want this? Why don't you want this? Why are you going to give up? Why are you not going to give up? So you confront all those things, and it becomes part of your mindset at everything that you do, right? And so when you look at, like, I don't want to break fall. Why don't you want to break fall? I just don't. I'm, af I'm afraid I'll get hurt. And then you, we create a situation where you're not going to get hurt. And then you realize, oh, it's not that big of a deal. Right. You know, that's, and then you think, oh, I, I don't think I could ever be good enough to, to become a black belt. And then I got the opportunity to, to test for the black belt and I passed. And not only did I pass, I passed well. And then I drove to that place and asked that girl out that I've been dying to ask out for five years. Right. And then she said no. And then, but that's okay. <laughs> but then it was okay because she said no, and it, the rejection wasn't that bad. Right. The fear, the anticipation is worse than the act itself. Yeah. Right? So change comes from the act of doing. So everything comes back to this box on top of your head, which helps you or hurts you. Mm -hmm. Right, the mind is a is a what is, what's the thing? The mind is a wonderful servant or a horrible master. Yeah, and I think that really brings us back to like you know kind of wrapping it up with the question, which is how do you how do you stay prepared for war and chaos? And I think we've sort of all three of us have kind of come at this, and and it comes back to as you say, you have to train physically and mentally um, on a consistent basis. Whether be, you want to or not. Whether you want to or not, especially when you don't. Um, if that's what you want. Some people, yeah, I just want to go golfing. Right. No, no, no. But, but Jackie's, uh, Jackie's asking the question, like, how do you do this if you're going to prepare <clears throat> for war and chaos? You have to constantly be searching out yeah. opportunities to, that are uncomfortable, stressful, s suffrage, hardship in order to grow. You right. think, oh, I will... I have a hurt finger. I will train so I know what it's like to train with a hurt finger. Oh, I'm I'm afraid. Oh, I'm gonna go. I'm afraid to train with this guy. Then I'm gonna train the entire class with this guy. Right. To confront that fear, to realize it was nothing. It was all just an illusion or delusion in your mind. So that's why it. Her question really is about mindset. Do you have the killer's mindset, warrior's mindset, whatever you want to call it? To where you're like, this is all an illusion of my mind saying that the, I can't, I won't, I won't be able to. And then go, why? Why Why can't I be the president? You can't be the president. Why? Why? Well, then you got to do that. You're going to have to do this, 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 and this. Absolutely. And that as a teacher, the, the hardest part is not to rob people of the opportunity to grow. Because even if they don't hit the mark, 
they still will grow. Right. So the, the opportunity, the, the teacher has to always be creating the opportunity and never stifle any person because you never know who's going to become who. You know, one time this girl asked me, hey, I was thinking about becoming a lawyer. And I was like, oh, really? Why do you want to become a lawyer? And she was my employee. And so we started, she told me all these reasons why she be, we wanted to be a lawyer. And I, I said, honestly, I don't think it's going to happen. Because in order to argue in front of the Supreme Court, blah, 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 you're going to need this, this, and this. And I just think, and I shouldn't have done that. Because she she stopped trying to be a lawyer. Mm, interesting. Right? I robbed her of the growth and the possibility of becoming that person. You never know. I was wrong. Okay. Hey, can I become president of the United States? Maybe. Ready to put the work in? Ready to be uncomfortable? No. Hey, you probably won't be. <laughs> right. <laughs> but if the, that person says, man, I want to be an Aikido teacher, I'd say, ready to put the work in? Right. Yes. Well, let's do this, man. I'll, right. do, I'll take you as far as I can take you. Hopefully that's far enough. Right? But if you think, yeah, you'll never make it. Like free, like free sense, you'd be like, your left foot, your, your other left, left foot, your other, <laughs> your other <laughs> left <laughs> foot. And then he would say, you should just quit. And I can't tell you how many people would, right after that, quit. quit. Yeah. Because they took his word as gospel. Right. And, you know, maybe he shouldn't have used that word, or maybe I don't even know, but maybe it, it's hard to balance the stress and stressfulness with the, um, the kindness and compassion and and stability and structure that that person might need yeah right because you don't really know where they're at mm -hmm. so if you you tell them no too much maybe that no breaks them you tell them yes too much the yes makes you soft right right so that's why since it talks about the psyche robot the i think that's the word that the the beauty of the plum blossom balanced with the hardness of the shell if you have too much war you become calloused and inhumane you have too much beauty you become weak right. mm -hmm. but you have to have this balance right but that's where you have to have trust and faith in your teacher the training and all those things that oh he's going to make me do something which i don't want to do but then that enables me to become good right there are several techniques that i that we do that i don't particularly care for them but i'm good at them because since they made me good at them right because he made us do them even though we didn't want to do them right and, you know, all these things, I mean, I am an ambivert. I mean, uh, you know, I'm an extrovert and an introvert. And it's funny because when I took the Myers-Briggs personality test, at the end, the person told me, I went, oh, wait, I, I did that with my extrovert personality, which my real personality is introverted. But now there it's, I'm an ambivert today. I'm both kind of half and half. half and half. But I, how did I, how did I learn to be an extrovert? Since it's like, you're going to be the speaker at the demonstration today. What? what? Hands me the script, and I'm like, the Aikido Center for Less. Talk or, about being uncomfortable. <laughs> or he was like, oh, the 30th anniversary, you're going to speak. Write a, write a speech and speak. What? You know, and he, he would just be like, yeah, you're going to do it. I'm like, oh, man. Uh, okay. And then, like, <clears throat> you know, but all those things, having to do demonstrations, Made it to where I can stand up in front of a crowd and be like, so anyways, Aikido's like this. Right. Before I'd been like, oh, no, I can't do it. <laughs> oh, you know, I mean, and that's that's the hard part. So it's of more about, again, confronting a stressful environment and training and doing it over and over and over again. Yeah. <clears throat> he, he got stress inoculated right up there on stage. So do you, I'll tell you, you know, as we, as we wrap this up, let me tell you a, a quick story about stress inoculation. So one day I came to the dojo and Sensei tells me, there's a guy coming to this five o'clock class that I want you to kick him out. And I go, why do you want to kick him out? He said, I just don't like him. And I go, well, what do you mean? And he's all, just kick him out. So I'm like, okay. He gives me the guy's file and the file's like 1984 uh, world Russian kickboxing champion. <laughs> this, 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 just, you know, fighter, this, the boxing. This. I'm like, oh, shoot. And then the guy shows up and he's like over six feet tall. He's super muscular. <clears throat> and I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> so I, I'm like the whole – so then I go, do I say I kick you out? But then that makes it me, and then I'm going to have to fight him. If I say we, that makes me look weak. I don't know what to do. So I just found something in the class that he couldn't do, and then it was just the two of us. No one showed up. 
So I just made him do this one technique over and over and over again. And the whole time, no, wrong, no, wrong, wrong. And then since he calls me upstairs he's like, during the class, he's like, what are you doing? And I go, oh, I'm just setting him up to kick him out. So he goes, just kick him out. <laughs> like that. <laughs> so we, I go, man, the class is over. So I stand at the door with his check in my hand. And then he comes to the, you know, he comes down. He's ready to leave. And I go, I don't even remember if I said we or I in that moment. But oh, I said no. that we, we, but I or we have decided not to accept your membership at the IQ Center in Los Angeles. Here's your check back. And the guy's face got stern. What? And then he went, he went from what to, are, are you serious? Like he was going to cry. Wow. And I was like, oh, shoot. And then he was like, but why? And I go, we just, you know, we're not going to accept your membership. And then he walked out. And the whole time I'm thinking, now I'm going to have to fight this guy in the parking lot. He was huge, a foot more than a foot taller than me. And a little bit older, too, but huge. Big and I was guy. like, oh, grizzled. my God. Yeah, grizzled. Drives a ca cab for a living in L.A. And I was like, oh, man. And the whole time, like, I'm thinking, I'm going to have to fight this guy in the parking lot. So talk about stress inoculation. So I go upstairs, and then Sensei goes, how was it? I said, never make me do that again. And Sensei deadpan looks at me and says, now you know how to do it. Mm. And I was like, Tss. I was all mad. <laughs> And then the whole time I dressed and I was leaving and the whole time walking You're to the car, it. I was like watching for an ambush, yeah, getting ready to like <laughs> bust into a stance and get, get it on with this dude. Got to the car, locked the doors, drove away. <laughs> <laughs> but the, I mean, I was like, I was sure yeah. that this dude was going to get, get to the car and be like, all right, I'm waiting for you at the car. But he wasn't there, you know. Oh. But the point is, is that since they stress inoculated me and then, you know, he said like, now you know how to do it. And I was like, sob damn it darn it like it was so stressful i mean but now i know how to do it right you know when i fired people when i was uh, a boss at a, at a job i fired a whole bunch of people and i'd be like i i've been here before yeah. not that bad not that bad of a thing so you know as we summarize this whole thing really it's it comes down to mindset yeah how do you overcome x mindset how do yeah. you deal with this Mindset. mindset yeah it doesn't matter what it is uh bro broken down car got person trying to kill you you know loss of a loved one you got to train yourself right you have to train yourself to realize that none of this matters it is that's why you think that a samurai could just give away their life so easily and just kill themselves they kill they kill themselves because really it's there's nothing in this world not it's that whole idea that honrai mu ichimotsu Nothing exists. Nothing exists before. Nothing exists now. So this is not that even big of a deal. But then we make it a big deal. Hmm. So really, on on Earth, it's all about mindset. All about how you engage people and engage that thing which is confronting you. Right? So, I mean, that's, that's the hard part. It's like, <clears throat> if you're lactose intolerant and someone gives you all this ice cream... Mm -hmm. Right, that's either the worst thing that's ever happened to you, or if, but if you like ice cream, that's the best thing that ever happened to you. It all, it's all mindset, right? Yeah, exactly. Sure. Well, I think we answered Jackie's question. Today. <laughs> Hopefully, I think we gave her a good answer. Yeah, and anyone else who wants to uh, send us a question, question, please send us questions, and we'll we'll try to get to your questions. Yeah, leave them in the comments if you want. But uh, thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast or video channel. Uh, and thank you for watching. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.